Our speaker today is Michael Ramson. Michael Ramson is, most importantly, as far as I'm concerned, a great friend. Uh, he's married to Anne. They have three children. Uh, he's a phenomenal person who, who has, is much in demand all over the world as a speaker. He runs the Oxford Center of Christian Apologetics, explaining to people reasons to believe. And he's in huge demand in the White House, the UN, all over the world. And it's a huge privilege that we have him here today. So I don't want to waste another second of his time. Would you give a very warm welcome to Michael Ramson? Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind and warm introduction. And indeed, it's, it's been a great encouragement in my life just uh, seeing uh, just how much life and vitality has come out of uh, this place and how um, both Nikki and um, Pippa have sought in their own life to continue to grow and to learn uh, and also to try new things and just see what may happen. And that brings with it this great sense of adventure. And in many senses, that's something I, I guess I'll be, I'd like to speak to you about this morning. Because it's not just simply the fact that in our lives we're all looking for something bigger and greater and stronger than ourselves that may inspire us. But we're also wondering and we're looking through in life just about what it is that really does and can change and transform everything around us. There are many uh, ways when we, when we think about what is it that may motivate a life that ultimately could make a difference in this world and indeed meet those greatest needs within us. But really, in many senses, what I want to show you this morning is the fact that there are all kinds of things that we may encounter, experience, and do that may have some kind of impact on us. But there's only one person who you can meet who will completely, totally, and utterly change your life in a way as such that it can never be like it was before. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. I'd like to um, read to you, if I can, um, just out of um, the, um, the Gospel of Luke, this may be a slightly uh, different um, uh, translation than you have. It's a very well-known story about Jesus as he's traveling through, um, uh, and he's t um, through um, Israel, and he's talking about the different place, uh, different, uh, as he goes through different places, he's talking about why he's come and why he's here. And this is um, and one instance just out of his life, and this is what it says out of the end of Luke 18 and the beginning of Luke 19. It says, as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the poolside, uh, roadside, poolside, uh, you can already tell I'm thinking about holidays, um, <laughs> sitting by the roadside begging. And, as, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so the man cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But all those who were with him rebuked him, saying, be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near to Jesus, he said, Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, I want to recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. He entered Jericho and was passing right through. And behold, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and he was rich and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was a small man in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see him. For he was about to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and came and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I now give to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anyone, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. You know, this is a remarkable story. The, the impact and the significance of it is sometimes lost on us, because if you have a Christian background, you may be very familiar with it. If you're visiting here, you may not have heard it at all. But either way, behind this very simple encounter lies an incredibly profound truth. Jesus Christ is traveling through, and people are beginning to ask a very basic question. Who are you? Who is Jesus Christ? And people are speculating about it. The, the conversation has indeed spread so far out through the land that people are now openly talking about who he is and what he is doing. Who is Jesus Christ? And as he comes to this great city, Jericho, the speculation is so great, the crowds come out to meet him. He comes to this huge city 
And, and before he's even got inside, a massive crowd come out to see him. And they're excited. They're cheering and they're clapping and they're welcoming him because they finally now get the opportunity to see someone of whom they've heard so much about. And there's a guy, a blind guy by the roadside, um, or maybe even a couple of them. One of their names is Bartimaeus. We know that in one of the other accounts about this story also in, in the gospel about Jesus Christ. And the guy says, what's happening? Because he can't see. And someone says, oh, Jesus, this guy Jesus, who's from Nazareth, he's, he's coming into town. And he calls out a very, in a very loud voice, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people around him turn around and tell him to shut up. Now that may seem, seem very harsh. It may seem very harsh to turn to a blind, poor, uneducated guy who joins in the crowd. I mean, after all, everyone else is yelling. And they turn to him and they say, shut up. And the reason they tell him to shut up is he's embarrassing them. And the reason why he's embarrassing them is he's employing a royal title. David was one of the greatest kings of the nation. And this blind, uneducated beggar at the top of his voice starts yelling out this royal title which is reserved for the coming of the Messiah. It has been reserved for the time when God himself would come as a king to his people. And now this blind guy who knows nothing and understands nothing yells out this royal title again and again, son of David, have mercy on me. Because this blind guy has put something together in his head. You see, he's been, he, he doesn't see, he sits and listens. And I don't know how many of you have experience with the blind, but sometimes the way they hear things, the way they remember things, and so on, it can be remarkable. And as he's heard the Bible being read and various prophecies being read about who, when, the time when God will come to his people, he's remembered those. And as he hears Jesus Christ's life and sees how he lives and what he does, he's joining the two together. And he's saying, you know what? The Bible promises there'll be a time when God himself will come to us. The son of David will come and he will set us free. And he's listening to the stories about Jesus Christ and he's putting the two and two together. And in the Gospel of Luke, this blind, uneducated man is the first person to use this royal title to describe Jesus Christ. He's actually figured out who Jesus Christ is. You know, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I, I, I would encourage people, if you're not a Christian, or even indeed if you are, it's sometimes interesting to look about who the Bible says God will be when he actually comes to us in human form. And then married up to the life of Christ. It's one of the things that you can do, you can do on the Alpha course, uh, where there's a talk about who is Jesus exactly? Who is he? And the fascinating thing about Jesus Christ is there's a lot of prophecy about him. In the Old Testament, it tells us where he will be born and to whom he will be born and the kinds of things he will do. Some people think that Jesus Christ was a very clever man and a little bit manipulative. And what he did is he came into this world and he lived his life to make it look like he was fulfilling all of these prophecies so that people would be misled and think that he was someone who he wasn't. But these prophecies, as I said, concern who his parents will be and where he will be born. And that's something very hard to control on the other side of the womb. And so this blind man has figured this out and he calls out, and now Jesus asks the man to be brought to him. Jesus doesn't go to him. You may notice that. Jesus normally went to people, but this time he orders the man to be brought to him. This blind man employs a royal title and Jesus Christ acts like a king. He orders the man to be brought into his presence and in the presence of everybody restores his sight so he can see. And this is remarkable. Just put yourself there in the crowd. Imagine you just come out of curiosity. Who is this guy Jesus? There's a lot of controversy about him. There's a lot of debate. Some people, think he's, some people think he's good. Some people think he's bad. Some people think he's genuine. Some people think he's a fake. And then all of a sudden, a guy who's been blind since birth suddenly can see. Now, how would you feel at that point if you saw that right up front? Well, the answer would be, wow. I mean, that's, that's impressive. And then Jesus goes through this great city, and you can just imagine the crowd getting bigger and bigger and bigger. After all, they're not just now hearing stories about him. He's just healed a blind guy as he's coming into the city. And he goes all the way through and then out the other side. And there's a guy in the city called Zacchaeus who's this very powerful business figure in that community. Now, for all kinds of reasons I'm not going to go into, Zacchaeus realizes that if he steps into the crowd, some people will resent him. And he actually feels very, very, very vulnerable. And he's not even sure if he wants anyone to see him wanting to see Jesus Christ. And so he comes just very surreptitiously and he climbs into a sycamore fig tree. The reason he picks out a sycamore fig tree is really very simple. They have very low lying branches. So the big branches grow out from near the base of the spine. They have giant leaves. So when you climb into a sycamore fig tree, you can like, almost like step into it. You can climb up and you're really well hidden. 
Okay, so they're easy to climb, and they've got lots of big foliage. And so he's hidden in the tree. And so I want you to imagine the scene now that Jesus Christ is coming into Jericho. A crowd comes out to meet him. With the crowd, he then heals someone so they can now see. He's now, after having done that, the crowd gets bigger. Why does the crowd get bigger? Well, of course the crowd gets bigger. Everybody who's there says to their brother or their friend, go and get the rest of the family. You won't believe what Jesus has done. They have to come and witness what happens next. So the crowd is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they follow him all the way through the city and out the other side, and they come to where this big sycamore fig tree is. Now, the sycamore fig tree is a little bit away from the main road. Now, why would I say that? I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, and the answer is really quite simple. There were regulations at the time about the growing of sycamore fig trees. They weren't allowed to be grown within city walls or next to the road. The reason is that they grow a very sticky fruit, which is a bit like superglue. So you can take little bits of sycamore fig, the, the fruit that grows, and when it gets ripe, you can flick it into people's clothes and hair, and you can't wash it out. You have to cut it out. That's the only way to get rid of it. Little boys love this fruit. <laughs> it, and as a result, you weren't allowed to have it grow within the city, and you weren't allowed to have it grow near the road. So there were rules and regulations. They used to cut down those trees. They used to keep them away because you didn't want them sticking to anything. So Zacchaeus is a little way away from the wall and from the road. And now this huge big group, it's walking through the city, and it takes a right turn or a left turn, whatever it is. They turn off the road, and they start walking straight to the tree. And when they get to the tree, Jesus stops, and he looks up into it, and he says, Zacchaeus. Now, nobody probably has noticed him up until this point. He's well hidden. Big tree, lots of foliage. And now everybody looks from the ground, Jesus, and they look up into the tree. And here's this deeply unpopular, exceedingly wealthy business guy hiding like a little child in a tree. And there's a sense of embarrassment here that the crowd are going to love. Have you ever noticed we sometimes get a perverse pleasure when we see somebody who's got more than us or more influence or whatever it is, and they, they now seem to be embarrassed in some way and they're suffering a little bit, and we secretly like it, because it's not us, and it's them. And besides, they probably deserve it anyway. Time they were brought down a few pegs. And Jesus calls Zacchaeus out of the tree, and the question everyone wants to know is, well, what will happen next? And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house today. And Jesus invites himself to this guy's house. And then something amazing happens. As Zacchaeus meets the person of Jesus Christ, he is completely, totally, and utterly transformed and changed. Everyone begins to complain about Jesus. How can you go to be a friend of him? You see, this is a hated person in the community. Nobody likes him. He's despised. Despised for his wealth, for his position, for his cozying up to the Roman Empire. Everybody's looking down on him. Nobody, nobody wants to be close to him. And he's totally changed. His heart is transformed. How do we know Zacchaeus' heart was transformed? Because after he meets the kindness and mercy and the love of Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ goes out of his way to welcome this outcast, he stands up and he says, look, right now, as a result of meeting you, Jesus, I want to give away half of everything I own to the poor. Well, that's a huge change of heart. And then he says, and if I've defrauded anybody, if I cheated anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. Now, the problem Zacchaeus has is he's cheated a lot of people. <laughs> the, the reason is, 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 that, is that the Romans massively underpaid their civil servants. Um, and this is a huge problem in many parts of the world today. If you underpay the public service, what they will do is they will, they will charge bribes to get normal things done. So there are many parts of the world where if you want to pay your taxes, buy a piece of land, conduct a business transaction, you have to pay a bribe because the clerk behind the desk who does the paperwork doesn't get paid enough themselves. And so what they do is they charge you to do the work that really they should be paid for by the government. So it breeds an inherent corruption within the system. And the trouble is when you breed it that way, the higher up you go, the more you can charge, and then greed takes over. So when you're no longer driven by need, you're then just driven by the desire to have more. And Zacchaeus is at the top of that tree as well. And so now he's built his wealth, which is why the Bible says he was very wealthy. It's putting the emphasis, this guy got a lot of money. He had a lot of income coming in. So when he stands up and says, hey, if I cheated anybody, everybody's sitting there going, what do you mean, Zacchaeus, if? <laughs> Almost the entire crowd, he's cheated them in one way or another. So when he stands up and he says, and I now, if I, if I cheat anyone, I'm going to repay four times the amount I cheated. I am telling you, that crowd at that point, I think at that point they're actually happy because they were grumbling and they were angry with Jesus and they can't believe Jesus has now picked out this guy for some kind of special favor. But as soon as they see the change in his heart, I can't help but wonder if they began to think, well, two things. Number one, I'm putting in my claim now. 
Okay, Zacchaeus, I'll thank you for saying that. I'm one of those people, and yes, you know, here's how much you owe me. But there would have been another question. And the other question would have been this. If you come from a hardened, cynical, especially business background, where you're beginning to get to really think that all every people who are interested in money and any talk about any kind of philanthropy is really just PR to make you look good. There wasn't a single business person in that community who wouldn't have appreciated the significance of what Zacchaeus just said. What has happened to his heart? And the answer is, he met Jesus Christ. He met the son of David, this promised king, God himself who would come into this world. And when you encounter him, he changes your heart. I have a very good friend in northern Nigeria. Um, he lives in part of the world where there's an organization called Boko Haram that's very active. And I had the privilege of seeing him a few months ago. and met him and his wife, Gloria. Uh, he was the archbishop of that part of the world and um, is out now actually an honorary archbishop and serving as the bishop. There have been multiple attempts on his life, but he and his wife have never wanted to leave. He went away on a trip once to speak at a conference and he came back 10 days later and when he came home, there were 12 children having dinner around his dinner table, which wasn't at all unusual, young kids. But as it began to get dark outside, he said to his wife, Gloria, you need to send the children home. It's not safe out there. They need to go to their homes. It's dark. And Gloria looked at Ben and said, these are our children. Ben said, what do you mean? She said, I adopted them while you're away. <laughs> he said, what have you done? She said, Ben, I had to. They were going to be killed. There was, there was nowhere for them to go, so I, so I, I took them in. And I think that night they had one of those conversations that married couples do have from time to time when one feels the other person made some kind of significant decision without consultation. <laughs> well, three months after that, he went away to speak at another conference he'd been invited to speak at, and when he got home, there were now 32 children sitting around his dinner table. <laughs> and as he walked into the house, he took one look at them and then looked at his wife, Gloria, and said, Gloria, what have you done? She said, Ben, I had to take them in. There was just no, nowhere for them to go. And so... They now had 32 kids. By the time she'd adopted about 62, Ben said to Gloria, you're gonna to have to stop adopting them. And this is one of the reasons he doesn't like to do international travel anymore. He, <laughs> or if he does travel, he always brings his wife with him. <laughs> but next to their house, very simple house in northern Nigeria, they've, they've built a dormitory with a school in it to house the 500 other children they haven't adopted but are now looking after. Well. Ben and Gloria weren't always Christians. As a matter of fact, at one point, they were even resentful and totally disinterested. But something happened to them. What happened to them? And the answer is, they met Jesus. They met the person of Jesus Christ, and it completely changed their heart. And when they encountered the love and the mercy and the kindness and the grace of God, as they saw how they had been treated, as they received that, it changed them. And they could never be the same again afterwards. I would, I would encourage every single one of you here, if you have never really looked into the question of who Jesus Christ is, come, come along to Alpha. Sign up and, and give it a go. Have a look at it. You will be amazed at not just simply the evidence for Jesus Christ's life, but what he said, what he taught, and what he did, and most importantly, who he was. It changes everything. Maybe um, you, you are a Christian, but you've never actually attended something like Alpha before. Well, why not just come along and actually see it? If you're really that nervous along, come along on the first night. If you think it's not any good, then don't invite your friends, but I can promise you something. If you come, you will. But I would just love to wrap up this time, if I could, just by even offering a brief prayer now, if I may. See, it's very possible to hear about God, and it's very possible at times to hold God at a distance. And that can be born sometimes because actually we know a lot, we have a lot of knowledge, but we're scared of making the last step. I, 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 just before I went over to Nigeria a couple of months ago, I had a taxi driver who was driving me somewhere and I got talking to him and he was Nigerian. And, and I said to him, oh, I said, um, I asked him about his name and the meaning of his name and then the root of his name. And then he said, well, look, my name was given to me because I was born in a Christian family in Nigeria. I said, well, do you go to church now? He says, no, I hate God and I hate the church. And he told me why. And I said, I'm really sorry to hear that. And when he told me some of one or two of the things he'd seen and experienced, I said to him, you know, that doesn't sound very Christian to me. And then he then said, look, I'm just not interested anymore. And so since he was a taxi driver, I said to him, tell me, as a taxi driver, has anyone ever offered you any fake money? He said, oh, yes, all the time. 
I said, does that mean that when we arrive at our destination and I offer you my 20 pound note to pay for the fare, you'll reject it because in the past you received something which was fake? And he just went very quiet. And I simply said to him, look, just because in the past you've experienced something which isn't real, fake, don't miss out on the reality of what God has to offer you because you've experienced something which is fake in the past. And so even if you have had that kind of experience in the past where you think, you know what, I can't believe this could possibly be true. Well, why not come along to a place where actually Jesus Christ is revered for who he really is and come and find out a chance to find out if he is real. But you, maybe you're in that position where actually all you simply want to do is just say a simple prayer of yes to Jesus Christ. And that's all I'm going to do now is offer a simple prayer. And if you're sitting here listening to this and you're thinking, you know what, Jesus, I, I think I really do want to meet you. And maybe you've even known the reality of this in the past, but it's been lost or it's, you've just held it at arm's length for whatever reason. Why not make an opportunity to say yes to him this morning? I'm wondering if you would just pray with me for a moment. Father, we want to thank you for the fact that you came to meet us, Lord God, in, your, in the Son and in the person of Jesus Christ. Father, it's an incredible thing to know that our lives could be totally changed and transformed as a result of meeting with you. And Lord, Father, I want to pray for everybody who is here, who came here this morning, even maybe with a desire not to meet you, but is sitting here knowing that you are real because you've been speaking to them, even as they've been listening to the testimonies and the talk. And I pray, Father, you may meet with them today. Father, Lord, I want to thank you for everyone who is here who has questions, doubts, struggles. And Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, that over the coming weeks and months, you would give them opportunity to find out who you really are. And Father, Lord, and Lord I want to just pray for anyone who is sat here who is wondering maybe if they should come along to the Alpha Course just to have the opportunity to find out who Jesus is. And Lord, Father, I pray you'll give them just that courage to say yes and see what it's like even if it's just for the first one. Father, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of knowing you and also for the difference, Lord, I want to thank you for the difference you made in my life. And I pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.